Number 32, Rodriguez versus the City of New York. Council? Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Joshua Kellner and I represent the plaintiff appellant, Carlos Rodriguez. Uh, may I reserve two minutes for rebuttal, Your Honor? Of course, sir. Thank you. Welcome. CPLR 3212. Uh, conditions a movement's entitlement to summary judgment on whether they've shown that judgment should be directed on their behalf. For a personal injury plaintiff, this requires a showing of two things. First, that the defendant was negligent, and second, that this negligence proximately caused the accident. Why is it? Was a proximate cause, all right, not the proximate cause, right? Uh, yes, of course, uh, Judge Feynman, and when we say proximate cause, we always mean a substantial factor. Okay. Why isn't the plaintiff required to show the absence of a defense as a ma to the claim as a matter of law? Isn't that what the case law says? Um, well, I think it depends on the type of defense, Judge Stein. Um, there are certain types of defenses that defeat the plaintiff's entitlement to judgment. But where, where, where does it say that? Um, well, what it says in, um, it's in CPLR 3212B, is that they have to show that there is no defense to the cause of action. So, for example, the emergency doctrine might be a defense to the cause of action. It negates the idea that the defendant was negligent. But here we're talking about comparative fault. That doesn't go to any element of a cause of action, and it doesn't negate the entitlement to judgment. Because that's the ultimate touchstone of whether you get summary judgment. And specifically, it's not a uh, bar to recovery. Yes. It's so, not, I'm sorry. I want to understand practically how you uh, imagine this working. Um, so the court grants partial summary judgment, like it does perhaps in a labor law case, um, and then does what? Does it give out a special verdict form that says uh, that has the box is already checked yes, yes on uh, the first two questions about the defendant's negligence? and then go from there, or how, how is this practically going to be implemented? Um, it would work exactly the way that Justice Acosta anticipated in his dissent in this case, that the court is, in effect, directing a verdict on the, the first two questions on any verdict sheet. Was the defendant negligent, and was that negligence a substantial, substantial factor? Fact. What does that achieve? I mean, because the, either way, the parties are going to be allowed to and, and, and certainly uh, have an incentive to lay out the, at least the degree of fault of each other. Um, and so what, it, what is really the purpose of granting partial summary judgment under these circumstances? Um, I'd say three things, Your Honor. Um, first, what it does is it effectuates the plain language of the CPLR, which anticipates that summary judgment is granted under the circumstances enumerated. Second, it realizes the purpose that underlies summary judgment, which is that when a party opposing a motion for summary judgment, given the opportunity to lay bare its proof, can't raise an issue of fact, it shouldn't go to a jury. Um, and third, what it's going to do is it's going to streamline the nature of the dispute, avoid the possibility for trials for show, where if the jury comes out the wrong way, a verdict to the contrary would need to be directed, and it's going to contribute to the likelihood for settlement because it's going to simplify the dispute, let the parties know what issues actually are in dispute and should so, be before the so, jury. So what you're saying is, is that after hearing all the proof, that once this um, direction is given, this ruling is given, um, that they cannot find that the plaintiff was the sole proximate cause. Yes, absolutely. It's part of our position, and it's in the CPLR, that to show that we're entitled to judgment, so, we so, have to sh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, uh, so what, how would that play out on summary judgment? Okay, so the issue of plaintiff's sole proximate cause. Are you saying then that the defendant has to show as a matter of law that the plaintiff is the sole proximate cause? Well, the in order to defeat this partial summary judgment m motion on the part of the plaintiff, that, that's, that's the part I don't really understand. Well, the plaintiff has to show that the defendant was negligent and that the negligence was a proximate cause. Okay, um, so, so how to do negate we get the to the sole proximate cause? Right, to negate the idea that the defendant was a proximate cause, um, they'd have to show that the plaintiff was the sole proximate cause. And that's a boundary or that this court... Or at least that there's a question of fact as to whether he's uh, the sole proximate cause or yes. she's the sole proximate cause. Yes. But, but and I would just, if I might, um, I would say that um, that's a boundary that this court routinely enforces in labor law cases, where it says, was the plaintiff, um, by his violations, 
the sole proximate cause of an accident. So it's been a manageable line to draw. But, but it, isn't this taking it, isn't the majority's opinion taking this to a, a, a place that they say is dictated by the decision in Toma? Um, it's what they said, Your Honor, but I don't believe it's the best reading of Toma. Oh, There's nothing in. Well, let's leave that aside for a second. Let's just agree on what the majority is saying here because it seems to me that they're creating a double burden for a plaintiff in a, uh, a summary judgment action in a negligence case. They're saying not only must you show that the uh, defendant uh, um, uh, was negligent and his negligence was the proximate cause of the accident, but you must show that you are free from any negligence in order to obtain summary judgment against your opponent. So your burden isn't just to prove um, that you, that this person over here was at fault, but you must also prove that you're entirely free from fault. And that doesn't seem to have any justification in the statutes. It has no justification in the statute. It, it also represents a significant change in the burden-shifting regimen that we apply to any other party. And I, I don't say this just as to plaintiffs. The same would apply to a defendant. Um, it seems to be a remarkable change. Um, and why do you think that their reading of Toma in the majority is incorrect? I would say that, first of all, as Your Honor said, the first principle is in the statute and in the standard this court has always used for summary judgment. Mm -hmm. um, so Toma is incorrect to whatever extent it's taken, or their reading is, to whatever extent it's taken to ignore the statute or largely to resurrect contributory negligence. Mm -hmm. As to Toma itself and what we think the best reading of it is, there's nothing in Toma, either in the briefing or in the decision itself, that tells us that it was intended to represent a major procedural rule. The court didn't cite any case law. It didn't cite any- Short memorandum. Um, so, so the question, I guess, in my mind is, do you think uh, we actually have to explicitly overrule Toma uh, to rule in your favor? Uh, or how, you know, how would you address it? Um, I'd address it the same way that Justice Acosta, Acosta did, um, which is he said that it raised and it directed itself to the issues the parties raised. And that's just intrinsic in the adversarial process. Courts don't go through fact patterns and issue spot. What they do is they address themselves to issues the parties have brought to the court's right. attention. Uh, I, I want to actually take you back uh, a step to whether or not um, you think that these writings from the both sides of the appellate division are uh, assuming that, in fact, there has been a prima facie case made by the plaintiff of negligence and that it was a substantial factor. Uh, is that, in other words, is liability being assumed uh, by both sides? Uh, and if not, how did you make out your prima facie case? Um, I think the city did dispute the issues of liability in the court below, but I don't know that there's any tribal issue of fact on it. Um, Mr. Rodriguez was in a sanitation parking lot, and his two co-workers lost control so, of So I'm familiar with the facts, right. but I, I just, you know, do you think that uh, all the, whether it's the Supreme Court and the uh, appellate division have assumed liability and just, you know, disputing whether or not uh, the plaintiff has to uh, sort of establish uh, their absence of uh, their own negligence, or th that's what I'm trying to get at. I mean, I understand how you mm -hmm. think. I don't think they've assumed liability. I think they've found there's no issue of fact on it. Um, obviously, they found the appellate division did, and the trial judge at least presumed that there was some showing of comparative negligence. We don't think there is any, but there's certainly no issue of fact as to the city's negligence or whether hitting a parked car was the proximate cause of the plaintiff's injuries. Okay, so we don't need to get into uh, whether or not uh, there was a violation of the VTL uh, that is uh, either per se negligence, and we don't need to get into what role uh, the violation of the sanitation's uh, own internal rules and regulations. None of that is something we need to concern ourselves with? I don't think it's necessary to the case. Um, the VTL is one way that the court could find the city was negligent. Another is just to say that they lost control of their truck due, a weather, due to a weather condition they all knew existed. Um, so no, I don't know that the court has to get into VTL issues, um, but the city clearly was negligent, and that's something that's true as a matter of the common law as well. Thank you, Mr. Kellner. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel? Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, I'm Richard Deering for the city. 
Uh, just to touch very briefly on, on your point, actually both courts below found questions of fact on the city's liability in addition to the plaintiff's comparative fault. Supreme Court said question of fact as to foreseeability and proximate cause. The first department oh, But if said, that's true, then why are they even getting to the second point? I think uh, that, was a, that was a second supporting ground, but, but honestly this court could affirm entirely on that first ground. Uh, saying that's an alternative ground. It is, an alternative independent ground, and I'll, I'll try to touch on it a little bit later. I'd first like to go into a little bit the broad broader question of, of the burden at summary, uh, summary judgment. I think the key question is, uh, uh, the practicality question is a key one. This is partial summary judgment. I think that's something very important to understand. This is not a pure 3212B summary judgment case is over. Everybody knows that this is partial summary judgment. There's going to be a trial. This we all know. Is that and discretionary on the court's part? To it is. 3212E makes it explicitly says may. I mean, that's the key language, not shall. That's 3212B. 3212E says may. It says further when warranted. And it ends with the clause on such terms as may be just. And those are all three very important textual elements of 3312E so when you're talking about partial summary So let me give you this hypothetical. Judgment. You have a, a plaintiff who's in the back of a cab. Uh, let's take it out of the facts of this case, sure. right? And uh, the, that plaintiff uh, is, is in the back of a cab that gets rear-ended, all right? Uh, and maybe that plaintiff isn't wearing his or her seat belt uh, or has done something else that uh, is arguably comparatively negligent uh, or goes to the mitigation of damages. Uh, um, why isn't that plaintiff uh, entitled to partial summary judgment against the defendant, even if that uh, defendant is going to then try to get contribution from the, the driver of the front vehicle? I mean, I think the key is, did, the, did that plaintiff do something that, that's arguably negligent? Many, in many such circumstances, the plaintiff will not have, in that case, will be buttoned up for the, from that standpoint at summary judgment. I think if the plaintiff did, then we're in, we're in this. So, so wait a minute. So, so if that's... So it's under the scheme, it is possible then to give that plaintiff partial summary judgment? I, I, partial summary judgment on liability in, in the scenario where the plaintiff has no comparative negligence, then it would go to damages. And we, we, didn't, we don't, uh, we acknowledge obviously as we must that. But, but what, but so, so they weren't wearing the seatbelt, so they were negligent. Mm -hmm. Why can't I, they get, let me just finish the thought, sure. why can't they get judgment against uh, one party and then the other party, the defense, they say, well, you were negligent too, then fine, bring your own motion. Well, I think the key question, if, if the plaintiff has, uh, if there's an issue of fact on contributory negligence, the, the real key, key question to ask is, what role is partial summary judgment playing Well, there's no contributory, I'm sure Well, if there's not, not if there's let not. Let me finish. There's no control on, there is no contributory negligence anymore. We're in a Fair period. enough. Okay, so, if so there's let's stick with that. Right. If there's comparative, we're, we're talking about partial summary judgment, and the key question is, what role is that meant to play? And, and here's really the role of partial summary judgment. It's not just a... Uh, back and forth on papers and something you do. You do it for a reason, and the reason it's done is to narrow the scope of what's presented at trial. That well, is the I don't know if that's, I, you know, I would like to uh, assume that, that there are motives that are devoid of financial motives, but it seems to me in, in negligence cases, quite often it's done to fix the data on which interest will begin to run. Let's assume it's that. Let's assume there's a financial motivation for it. It doesn't make it wrong. It doesn't make it improper. It doesn't certainly make it illegal or unethical in any way. They just say, I want an earlier date to have my interest run because I think I'm going to win because you're so clearly negligent. That's not you. I, I would say that's putting the cart before the horse in that. But, that's but not what it's drives. A common, it's a common motivation. It may be say. a motivation, but it's not what drives from the standpoint of, the, of the, the way the court system is set up. It's not what drives whether someone gets summary judgment or not. And, that's correct. And what, what drives that is when it's partial summary judgment, and there's cases, many cases that hold this, that, that you, you look for a substantial narrowing of the scope of what's going to be presented at trial. And in fact, actually, there are several cases from all four departments of the appellate division that say isn't even Isn't it also when, to focus what the jury is going to look at? So if, the, if you're taking away from the jury the opportunity to make a decision, because that's already been made, that the city is not at all negligent, right? That's been taken off the table. You have some negligence. You're now focusing the jury. You, you are correct to the extent that perhaps both sides are presenting the same evidence or overlapping evidence that it would have been necessary on summary judgment. But now you focus the jury on the particular issues you want them to decide, as Judge Feynman was saying before. You've got your list of questions. They're not getting to the first two. You're moving on from there. 
Well, I, I don't think you're going to, I don't think you're really going to meaningfully focus the jury at all. And I think the, 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 the most succinct statement of this is actually from the third department, 1984. How's that? They're not going to discuss whether or not you're negligent. They're just going to discuss well, gonna how, by how much. Well, I, I think that those questions. You're not going to be at zero. That's fair, but, but, it, but to the extent it focuses, it focuses at 1% out of 100%. It, it, it's, it's a best a minor, a minor marginal focus. But see, that, is, that really, is that really correct? Because to follow up on, on Judge Rivera's point, what it does is it says we have this series of questions that the jury has to be asked. Negligence, proximate cause, damages, wh what form the damages take. It, it, I've probably done 100 automobile accidents, and it's always been the same form. And it usually in these things, the fewer cases that, that you have, the fewer questions, I'm sorry, that you have to put to the jury, the easier it is for everybody as they move forward. I, I, so from a, from a court point of view, uh, you, the questions that are clearly decided, we don't need to put those to the jury because sometimes they get them wrong, even though, and then, we're, then we've got a big mess on our hands. And uh, it's, it's more efficient in terms of the as you proceed forward in trial. So, so there is a practical point of view for doing that. It does narrow the issues. That, that's a legitimate and a very common summary judgment method. If people sue and they'll have seven or eight causes of action in point of fact, only one or two may be legitimate. You get rid of them. And that, that's what this is on one hand. And there are real world practical reasons to do it, but those, those reasons are always there, aren't they? I'd like you to really focus on the majority's decision and what I've referred to as a double burden being pr created on the moving party for summary judgment, that to not just prove that the person they're moving against is negligent, but proving their own negligent, that they are negligent free. That's sure. what they seem to be saying in the majority. Uh, I don't think it's a double burden. It, is, it, is, it follows from the CPR when it says you must show that there's not only the elements of your cause of action, but that there's no defense to the cause of action or that the defense has no merit. Oh, and well, the, the def when they say no def defense, they mean affirmative defenses, don't they? They mean affirmative, any defense. That's what no defense means, no defense. That, that, that's the literal language of the statute. I think, truly, if, if the whole sole concern is how the jury is instructed in truth, that could be decided when the jury is instructed. The, the real function of partial summary judgment is to narrow the scope of the proof at trial. And if I could just get to what the third department said, this was 1984, uh, clearly a court that is uh, grappling with the change to comparative negligence. And, and I think they put it as well as it could be put there in denying partial summary judgment to a plaintiff on precisely this ground. Granting plaintiff's motions would be illusory and spare neither the courts nor the litigants time and effort. This is the EB Metals case, by the way. The issue of plaintiff's comparative negligence would still need to be resolved, which resolution would require a comparison of the party's culpable conduct, thereby necessitating a trial examination of the nature and extent of the defendant's alleged breach. I, I think you may have already answered the question, but I just want to be sure I understand. Are you saying that the, in this case, the plaintiff must um, disprove her own negligence or his own negligence um, as the initial burden on summary judgment? Or are you saying that once they proved defendant's negligence, then the burden shifts back to you, and you can show a question of fact as to the plaintiff's negligence. I think the way, or I think under either either version, we would win this appeal. I mean, I, I think that the that the standard summary judgment law in New York is that the moving part, party bears the burden at summary judgment, even on elements or defenses that they would not bear the burden on a trial. So that is that is the that is laid out very clearly in the Young Tung Chow case, Judge Smith's concurrence there, that explains how New York New York practice works in that could you, regard. Could you spend a second identifying the issues that, in your view, bar uh, the plaintiff from getting? summary judgment, the tribal issues? Uh, yes, I think there are two, and I'll start with comparative negligence, but I'd, I'd also like to touch on the city's negligence, because I think that's an independent... Do you mind starting the other way? I'll, absolutely. I'll start the other way. I think the, uh, this case could, should w well go to a jury on the city's negligence approximate cause, but it needs to go to a jury, and, and the reason is two major reasons. One are the conditions that, are, that everybody agrees were present. The, the plaintiff himself says there's patches of ice and no ice on this, on this surface that the, that the truck had to be backed over. It was snowing. It had snowed a lot that month. Uh, they've been ordered by supervisors on a rush basis to get 10 trucks outfitted with chains and plows to go out on the city streets and keep them safe. And what that means in part, importantly, is that this truck doesn't have chains on it at the time when it's navigating this surface. A 75-foot-long, 20-ton 
garbage truck. That's the conditions. That, that is, this is not a case where you just have a party backing a vehicle into another party vehicle. That both in the nature of the vehicle and the conditions makes it very different. The second question that raises on the city's negligence issue is what were reasonable precautions taken? That's the standard. Not not anything beyond that. Not did they do, did they pay the highest degree of attention? That was the safety agent's analysis. That's not the question. It was, was, were reasonable precautions taken? What we know, there was a guide person to help the person back up. That we know. Well, didn't that person stand in the wrong place? That's disputed. That's disputed. And, and there's also no law that says, as a matter of law, that the guide person needs to be on one side or another as a matter of reasonable oh. precautions. There were practices. No, but your own regulations do. But that's not dispositive on, on negligence. This court has said that many times. And remember, we're not, we're not talking about whether Mr. Kellner might not have a powerful argument to the jury at trial to that effect. The question, the question is, does it go to a jury? And I think it clearly does. And, that, and the safety regulations would not take it out from the jury. Judge, so, Judge would it be all right? Can I yes, ask just course. one more? Yeah, mm -hmm. If that's OK. Um, uh, listen, uh, 14, when we're talking about 1412 in the CPLR, we're talking about culpable conduct. And, and uh, that's the defense we're talking about here, right? Sure. All right. And in 1411, it says uh, culpable conduct shall be an affirmative defense to be pleaded and proved by the party asserting the defense. Not the plaintiff. The plaintiff is inserting a defense to their own culpable conduct. That's not what the statute says. Did you bring a motion on the plaintiff's culpable conduct asking for summary judgment against the plaintiff? Not on that basis. We did bring a motion, but not on that basis. We did that. that you don't know. Let just, let's just stick with the statute for a second, all right? So you didn't bring the motion, yet you want them to provide an affirmative defense that the statute sets out that you have to assert. You want them to answer the question on culpable conduct when you haven't brought the motion on culpable conduct. That's an affirmative defense that has to be asserted by the defendant, not by the plaintiff. Well, we, we did raise the defense in our answer, which is the obligation we had at that point. The, the, the no, I just, I understand that. You, you, you didn't do it in summary that judgment. Trial, trial. Right? Yes, and that 1412 uh, or makes it a, our burden at trial. But in, in New York, the movement bears the burden on all of those elements, including affirmative defense. I'd like, if I could, to finish my answer to, you, to your question about negligence, which are the precautions that are relevant, not just the presence of a guy person. Everyone admits he was dri driving exceptionally slow. That's the words of the plaintiff, that, the, that the dr it was driving exceptionally slow on this terrain. The, the truck, of course, was beeping. It has a huge bright white light that is engaged when it's, when it's in reverse. So the question whether reasonable precautions were taken is a question that a jury would need to decide. It may be that there's, the plaintiff has a strong case before the jury, but it's not a, the kind of case you see where there's negligence as a matter of law. And I, I'd, I'd refer to the yes. court. Okay. Uh, let me ask you, counsel. I just want to go back to an earlier point you made about the, the city's negligence, what you're talking about now, as an alternative ground to affirm. Are you suggesting we don't have to reach this question? I think that's right. You don't have okay, to reach the question. Okay, but if there is a trial, don't we have to reach the question so that the the parties know what are the questions being posed to the jury? Well, I don't think you, you, you're saying I don't, you don't have to reach which question. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to reach the question of whether comparative negligence on its own would defeat summary judgment because in any case there are questions of fact as to defendant's not, mm -hmm. negligence and, and proximate cause as to the defendant's. And that means it's clear that all four of those questions should be presented to the jury at trial. The, the only thing I'd like to say lastly is that uh, the, question of, and the question of how a jury should be instructed is always a question that can be answered when the jury needs to be instructed. Partial summary judgment is really and mainly about narrowing the proof that needs to be made at trial. And for the reasons identified in the E.B. Meadows case and many others, that a, a partial summary judgment of this nature uh, where, where comparative negligence is outstanding would not do that. And the reason is that, that both parties are going to need to, and if I could just quote from the patent jury instruction, which I think makes this succinctly and nicely. This is what the PJI says when you're about to, the jury is about to assess the issue of comparative negligence. Weighing all the facts and circumstances, you must consider the total fault that is the fault of both the plaintiff and defendant. You must weigh all the facts and circumstances. They must be all presented to the jury. The jury must be given guidance about how to weigh those, meaning guidance about the standard of care and the standard of proximate yeah, cause as the, to both the, the parties. The problem uh, ultimately becomes uh, uh, now what happens if um, they uh, 
uh, in a case where there's clearly negligence um, by the defendant, uh, if, if we adopt your approach, uh, they now put a zero for the defendant. Um, that, that is the posited concern of the dissent. They, they've identified no case where that's actually ever happened. I mean, this has been the prevailing rule in the second and third departments, and more than half of the decisions in the first department, three decisions of this court, no one's identified a case where that's happened. If it ever did happen... But isn't that also what the majority says, that it's possible at, at trial? It did, because so, there's... So a both sides in that decision think that this is a possibility. I think that's right, but for a different reason. And, the, and the, well, the, the majority thinks it's possible because the majority, I would submit, does not fi finds a fact question on the on the city's pro on proximate cause as to the city, which I think was correct and is an independent ground for resolving this case. I just say, firstly, if that ever happened, that could be resolved by it could be addressed then. It could be that that verdict could be set aside. The case would have to be retried. As far as I know, it's never happened. I don't think it's a good basis to flip a rule and 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 change the way this is done in every case because of one scenario that's never happened. I can just push you on that one point you made and be my last question, Chief. My apologies. Or uh, uh, your reading of 3212B that says no defense, right? But it says no defense to the cause of action, which you already, I thought, conceded that it's not a defense to the cause of action, right? I, just, I would describe it as, as a defense to the cause of action. About how to mitigate how much you might have to pay, but it's not a defense in the sense of saying you're not going to be liable. It is not a complete bar, but it is a defense that goes to, properly seen, goes to liability. And uh, honestly, the, def the dissent in the first department acknowledged that, saying that if this goes back down, uh, it, comparative negligence will not be resolved at a trial on damages. It will be resolved at a trial on liability. It's a defense that goes to liability, uh, not to damages, although it is not a complete bar. And you can see that through a few, you know, a few ways. The, the basic question is who bears legal responsibility for, this, for these, this harm, not what is the quantum of harm that resulted. It's who bears legal responsibility. It turns on questions of culpable conduct and proximate cause. And uh, as a result, it's better seen as a defense going to the cause of action. In any case, this is not a 3212B motion purely. It's a motion for partial summary judgment under 3212E and therefore really needs to be resolved under the practical considerations that drive partial summary judgment under the cases we've cited, uh, both about comparative negligence and about partial summary judgment work generally. Thank you, thank you. counsel. Mr. Keller? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. I may ask the court for a little bit of additional time, just given that this argument perhaps has covered, um, it's gone to overtime. Let's see how it goes. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> um, if I might, I want to come back to where Judge Rivera ended the last argument. Um, CPLR 3212B, it says that they have to show that there is no defense to the cause of action. And defense counsel didn't say that comparative negligence is a defense to a cause of action. That's something that's established by CPLR 1411 and 12. What, is, what would you call it? Um, it's a defense that operates in diminution of damages. Um, that's how it's defined by Article 14A. Um, and it actually it also, sounds... It goes, it goes to the relative liability of the parties, doesn't it? Um, it goes to an apportionment between the parties, but it doesn't go to any element of the cause of action, and it doesn't defeat an entitlement to judgment. Um, and so when we look at the wording of B, the ultimate burden for a movement on summary judgment is to show that judgment should be directed on their behalf as a matter of law. Well, and what about his argument that it's uh, E, uh, 3212 E, not B, that we should be looking at? Um, I think it's under B, because what we're really looking for is whether the plaintiff has met the elements that go into establishing that they're entitled to judgment. And for so, so partial, so then what is your definition of, when does E apply then? Only when, what, you have d separate causes of action? Is that the only time? Um, I think E applies in a couple of cases. Um, it discusses some of them. It says that summary judgment can go to non-movements. It says that courts can resolve parts of causes of action. It says that, for example, if I have a 240 isn't and a 241.6. Isn't this part of a cause of action? No, because the elements of the cause of action are duty, breach, causation. <laughs> And those are the issues that are bound up in the summary judgment motion. They had a duty of care. They breached the duty of care. And I'll talk about the facts in a moment, if so I you, could. You read, and causation. You read subdivision E as, as being exclusive to those situations. I think subdivision E um, touches on other issues. So for example, it would let a court say the defendant was negligent as a matter of law without resolving causation. <laughs> but a problem with the city's position is that they don't even acknowledge E. 
What they say is that a court can't even follow E and resolve negligence on behalf of the plaintiff if they don't rule out comparative negligence. And that's also against the wording of the statute because it says that it applies except in certain kinds of matrimonial circumstances. So they're not only ignoring B as it relates to this case because we've shown that we'll be entitled to judgment against the city, they're ignoring E as well because they're saying that courts don't even have discretion or the opportunity to say that the city is negligent as a matter of law. And that's how far their position is divorced from the plain wording of the statute. And that's where the framework should be applied and it's where the case should end as far as the legal framework. Um, I also do want to talk about um, the conditions and the facts of the city's negligence here. Um, council talked about some of the things that may have complicated circumstances for the city. But they get very far divorced from what the duty of care of a motor vehicle operator is. And that's to maintain control of your vehicle under whatever the conditions are. <coughs> they knew it was icy in the parking lot. They knew that there was ice on the, the driveway. They'd already put four trucks into the garage without issue. And neither Mr. Ramos nor Mr. Carter said that this was something that was caused by the mm. weather. Ramos said it was caused because he slammed on his brakes too hard on the ice and he couldn't get control of the truck back. And Carter says it was because Ramos ignored him for a prolonged period of time. Carter even said, and I believe it's on page 134 of the record, um, that, or 125, that Ramos told him at the end of it that he felt the truck sliding, but that he thought he could move over around the car into the garage. Well, you know, rather than go through all the details of the facts, isn't it, mm -hmm. isn't this really a situation where um, the plaintiff wasn't driving the truck? So whoever was driving the truck made an error. And, and what form their error took is, is, is arguable, but nonetheless, they made an error. Any reasonable person is going to say that. The only real question on a negligence point of view is, was the plaintiff negligent for being behind the car when he shouldn't have been in that area? That's a question, that may be a question of fact. So if that is true, if, if it's a question of fact as a plaintiff, are you precluded from getting summary judgment against the people who are driving a truck who are obviously a substantial factor in slamming the car into the guy? The only, the, that, that's clear as, as any reasonable person could make it. The one question that we have to have is, should you be barred from getting that decision if, uh, and it does appear that there may be some comparative fault on the plaintiff because it may have been where he shouldn't have been. Assuming Isn't that there's comparative fault. Right the facts almost right. speak right. for themselves. The facts are, so the only question is, is whatever percentage of negligence a reasonable person may put on the plaintiff, is that relevant in determining whether or not you find the other party is, is negligent as a matter of law? It's not, Your Honor. And Your Honor is right. There is no reasonable issue here about whether the city was negligent or whether it was a proximate cause. Yeah. Um, what they are doing here is they are imposing a double burden on plaintiffs who are movements. They're requiring them to meet all of the elements in the statute, negligence, proximate cause, and they're also requiring them to negate an affirmative defense that doesn't bear on any element of a cause of action and that operates purely in diminution of damages. Um, CPLR 3212C addresses what happens if the only remaining issue is in diminution of damages. Summary judgment is directed under B, um, and then we have a trial on the remaining issues that relate to damages. The very purpose of Article 14A was to do away with contributory negligence in this state. And the rule that the appellate division followed here is largely fashioned from its remnants. It builds comparative fault back into the plaintiff's prima facie burden, which it shouldn't be conceptually. Um, and it says that if the plaintiff can't rule that out as well, that the court won't recognize the defendant's liability or the plaintiff's entitlement to judgment. That sounds a lot like contributory negligence, and it's contrary to two statutes. Thank you, 32, Council. 12 and 14. Thank you, Your Honor.